So there are over 4,000 minerals in the Earth's crust, and um, they are grouped based on similar chemistry. And the reason is because often minerals with similar chemistry will have similar properties. So we're going to talk about six of the mineral groups or the mineral families um, today. We're going to start with the largest number of, or the largest mineral family on Earth, which is called the silicate group. Um, and it's named that because all minerals in the silicate group contain what's called the silicon oxygen tetrahedron. Silicon and oxygen are the two elements that are the most common in the Earth's crust. Um, oxygen is over 45% of the Earth's crust and silicon is about 27% of the Earth's crust. There's really only about eight different elements that make up 90% of the Earth's crust. What we see here is that silicon oxygen tetrahedron. So there's just a lot of silicon and oxygen laying around. And silicon and oxygen tends to bond in this particular configuration, where you have one silicon atom, which is this small blue ball in this ball and stick model here. And it is bonded, which is what these little lines indicate, to one, two, three, four oxygen atoms, or oxygen ions, really, because they're charged. And this particular ball and stick model kind of stretches out the molecule, but in reality, it forms this type of shape, which is a little pyramid shape, which is also called a tetrahedron. So out of the 4,000 minerals, about, sorry, about 600 of them fall into the silicate group. And the reason is because of the chemistry of the silicon oxygen tetrahedron. With the silicon oxygen tetrahedron, it is a charged particle. So lots of different ions would like to bond with it. So within the ion itself, silicon has a plus four value. Ox and each oxide ion has a negative two value, or negative two charge. So one thing that's true is that when ions bond, they like to be electrically neutral. So what silicon will do here is it becomes electrically neutral by sharing or by being attracted to one of the electrons that is in oxygen. So each one lends like a negative one charge. So you have negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, which makes silicon electrically neutral. So silicon is really happy with this configuration. Oxides ions are not though because each one of them has a negative charge of uh, has a charge of negative one and is not electrically neutral so what ox the oxide ion will do is it will actually bond with almost anything um, so there uh, mentioned there were about eight elements that were super common in the earth's crust um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in another assignment but regardless um, oxygen will bond with pretty much all of those ions. And so it will form a whole bunch of molecules with a lot of calcium or a whole bunch of molecules with a lot of magnesium or aluminum or potassium or some combination thereof. And it will bond in different configurations. So this isn't anything that you necessarily need to know. This is just to illustrate why there are so many silicate minerals in the earth. And so sometimes silicate minerals, will, each one of these little triangles represents a silicon oxygen tetrahedron. And sometimes like in quartz, they'll stay all by themselves and you have just independent silicon oxygen tetrahedrons. Other times they will link up to form chains, uh, single chains. Sometimes they will form double chains um, that will then bond together. Uh, sometimes they'll form sheet-like structures like you might see in biotite or muscovite. Sometimes they form really complex silicate networks, but the charge is and the abundance of silicon and oxygen in the Earth's crust is really what makes it the biggest mineral group because it'll bond with so many different things. So we're going to talk about five other mineral families, and we're going to start by looking at this mineral, which should look familiar from lab. So this is a mineral that has cubic cleavage. You can see that it breaks into small little cubes, which is three directions of cleavage. You probably notice that it has a metallic luster. And if you were to hold this, you, it would be pretty heavy. And the reason is because of the chemical formula of this mineral, which is named galena, by the way. So the chemical formula for this mineral is one atom of lead, which is what PB is, and one sulfide ion, which is what S is. So the lead is what makes it really heavy. 
if we look at the chemical formula, the beginning of the chemical formula is often referred to by chemists as the cation. And But what we're interested in is the end of the chemical formula, which is sulfide here, and that is our anion. When you're looking at a mineral, you can determine what its mineral family is by looking at its anion, and you're going to get some practice with this at the end of this uh, little video. So. Galena is a member of what's called the sulfide group because its anion, or the end of its chemical formula, is the sulfide ion. All right. So with, by that same token, we're going to look at this mineral. And hopefully this also looks familiar from lab. What you might notice is that this mineral has one, two, three, four, five, six sides, totally flat sides, that form a hexagonal crystal. One of the things that we talked about in lab last week is that hexagonal crystals form when minerals grow in big empty spaces. They are not, however, cleavage because if you were to break this mineral, which would be very hard because it has a hardness of nine, if you were to break this mineral, it would shatter. Because this mineral has a hardness of nine, it's actually used as a source for gemstones because it's very resistant to abrasion um, when it's used as jewelry or used for anything else. So this mineral is actually the ore that is used for sapphires, which is this blue mineral here, and for rubies, which is this reddish pink mineral here. Um, the star shape that you see in this ruby is caused by an impurity of titanium. So you can see here really clearly how color is not the best way to determine what um, a mineral's identity might be because these vary tremendously. Um, but the hardness of it is because as I mentioned, this mineral has a hardness of nine. If we look at the chemical formula of the mineral, we see that it's composed of two atoms of aluminum and three oxide ions. And this is again the anion, this is what we're interested in because the oxide ion, because the anion here is oxide, this corundum, which is the mineral that we're looking at right now, corundum is a member of the oxide group because the anion in its chemical formula is oxide. All right, so as we move on to the next group, I just want to show you this picture and remind you that this is actually real. Um, this is a spot, it's called the Naica Mine in Mexico. It was discovered quite by accident. There was a silver company that was extracting minerals and they pumped out a whole bunch of water and ended up emptying out this cave, which is typically full of water. And what they found were gypsum crystals that were 40 to 50 feet long. And you can see this man walking on one of the gypsum crystals. You can see the chemical formula for gypsum up here, that it's composed of an atom of calcium, a and a molecule of what's called sulfate, SO4 is sulfate, as well as two water molecules. So two H2O is water. And um, we're less interested in the water here than we are in the sulfate. So I'll bring you back to that in just a second. Um, so this place is crazy. And it was just, I mentioned how it was discovered. Um, one scientist found it. There's a lot of really cool documentaries about this gypsum mine. But um, there were a couple months where people were allowed to go explore it and documentaries were made about it. Uh, ultimately, though, it was filled back up with water. You can't go here anymore. Uh, part of the reason is safety. If you were to fall off of one of these 40 to 50 foot long crystals, it's very likely that you would impale yourself on another gypsum blade. Um, part of it is the stability of the cave. Um, if the there was no water kind of holding the roof of the cave up it was a concern that the cave might collapse so the reason that these gypsum crystals grew so large is that there was there's volcanic activity in the area there's a lot of sulfate gases in the um, in the volcano so the sulfate gases were kind of being swept off through water um, right from the volcano and it moved up through a fracture and it moved up through um, a rock called limestone. Limestone actually has calcite in it. As you recall, calcite dissolves when there's acid. So the calcite in the uh, limestone dissolved away and created a cave. That created some calcium, and then the sulfate came from the magma chamber, and the water also came from the magma chamber. So you had all the ingredients here for gypsum, and over time, over thousands of years really, uh, these very large gypsum crystals grew in the water over a thousand feet below the surface of the earth, which is super cool.
So I mentioned sulfate a few times. Gypsum is a member of what's called the sulfate group. And the sulfate group is any mineral that contains the sulfate ion, which is the SO4 ion. If you look here, um, chemists always put the charge of the ion at the very end. We're less interested in that. We're really looking at the SO4, which is again, the sulfate molecule. So that's fun. There's two more we're gonna talk about. Um, and one is represented by this mineral. This is something you've also seen in lab. Um, you know, might notice this also has cubic or three directions of cleavage, right? One, two, and then the third on the opposite side. Um, this mineral also is sort of translucent and tastes salty if you were to look at it in real life. Um, and here's its chemical formula. It's an atom of sodium, or, yeah, an ion of sodium and an ion of chloride. So again, we're always more interested in the anion, and we'll come back to that in just a second. So I hope you remember what the name of this mineral is. It's kind of a big deal locally. It's called halite. Um, it's also a big component in rock salt. So speaking of rock salt, um, not that far from Rochester and Mount Morris is the American rock salt mine. And here is a picture from the American rock salt mine. It's right off, uh, if you're traveling through Rochester and you drive south, uh, near Mount Morris, you'll see a giant pile of uh, salt on the side of the road right near I-390 as you're traveling south. Um, and what's cool, so I didn't take this picture, but I've been in the mine before, and it's over 11 or 1,200 feet below the surface of the earth, which is really scary. Um, so you get in these huge elevators and move down, um, but what you... Uh, when you get down there, you realize that the equipment is actually too big for the elevator, which means that when this huge equipment was delivered to the rock salt mine, it had to be taken apart, brought down 1,200 feet, and then reassembled um, below the earth. And that is kind of crazy. So halite is a member of what's called the halide group. Um, so chemists um, have named certain columns of the periodic table and I'll put a link to the periodic table in your in your um, folder so you can see it but basically the very last column on the right hand side is called the noble gases the second to last column on the right hand side are called the halogens and chloride is a halogen ion so anytime you see an anion that ends in one of the halogen elements. It is part of the halide group. All right. So our very last mineral group that we're going to discuss includes this mineral, um, which you can see, which is not a great picture in terms of cleavage because it's not very clear on here. But regardless, it is one of the most distinctive properties of this mineral, which is calcite, is that it reacts to hydrochloric acid right away. And the mineral, the chemical formula for calcite is one atom of calcium and what's called the carbonate ion. Um, so the calcite is actually a member of the carbonate group, which is the CO3 molecule. So what is happening chemically when you put acid on a piece of calcite is you're actually liberating carbon dioxide. That's the gas bubbles that are forming. Carbon dioxide is CO2. It's actually trapped inside the carbonate ion and it is released when acid is applied. It's not the only carbonate mineral that you've seen. You've also seen dolomite and this is actually this is my old advisor um, from SUNY Geneseo whacking away on some dolomite. Dolomite is really <clears throat> important in central New York. The Niagara Falls flows over dolomite um, and there's rock layers of dolomite in like the Penfield Quarry and the Walworth Quarry and the Leroy Quarry if you live close to Rochester. Um, and it's also the host rock for what are called the Herkimer diamonds. So they're not actually diamonds. Um, you can tell your friends and family that they're not really diamonds. It's actually just quartz. So dolomite also reacts to acid, but it's a much weaker reaction. Over time, though, groundwater that's a little acidic will dissolve some small holes in the dolomite. And when there's other groundwater that moves through that is containing quartz or SiO2, what will happen is that quartz will form these really pretty crystals inside the holes that have been created by the acid in the dolomite. So there's a place called Her the Herkimer Diamond Mine where you can go and whack on some dolomite and find some sweet quartz crystals um, that are they call Herkimer Diamonds, but again, are not. Um, but regardless, so these are six mineral groups, and what you're going to do is a short activity that basically practices assigning groups based on mineral chemistry.